All right. Well, happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. Woo! Greatest day. Huh? The day why we are here and why we have eternal life. And such a day to celebrate the blessings that we have. Uh, before I start today's message, uh, I kind of want to pick up last week. You know, Nathan was doing a, a discussion on uh, out of Luke 19 and different ones shared what, you know, what they got out of it, what stuck out to them. And so I get to have my turn now. Uh, so one thing that stood out to me was that the phrase that said, my house should be called a house of prayer. And yet, I think as we look at the church and even ourselves, we do a lot of teaching and preaching, but how much praying are we actually doing? And it's good to pray in our own time and home, but it's also good corporately to come together and pray together as a, as a body. So every Wednesday night, we have open here between 6 and 8 o'clock, and we have time for people can come and go and just come and worship and pray. We'll have open microphones so you can come, and if you want to share a verse, a, a prayer, you can do that, and it's in that atmosphere of worship. So I think we need to more concentrate on that fact that we are to be called a house of prayer. That is the top priority above those other things. The other thing I got was that when he was talking about how Jesus, you know, said, rebuked him for not recognizing the day of their visitation, talking about the, the Jewish people. And it made me think, I just recently finished uh, three books on Lonnie Frisbee's life, and it took three full volumes. And it's really quite interesting because, I mean, it, it tells the good, the bad, and the ugly covers basically everything. And I've told you before how he got saved, that he was a, a hippie and uh, went up by Palm Springs and he, he dropped some acid and, and uh, got naked because that's what he, he was a, a naked uh, vegetarian, you know. <laughs> and then he's challenging God, you know, he said, God, if you're real, you show me. And he's up there by himself and the Lord, his presence all of a sudden just comes. And all of a sudden, the fear of the Lord came upon him, and the Lord revealed himself to him and, said, and basically said, I am Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. And that's where they got the one way, the sign of the Jesus revolution, right? But it, another thing that he told him, which seemed kind of out of character, for everything he was doing right at that time because it was basically about him and, and what he was going to do and what his calling was. He says, he tells him, says, it is better for a nation never to have known the Lord than to have known the Lord and turned their back on him. So that's a sober thing for us as a nation. All right, so... We don't have an overhead today. But anyway, the title of the message today is The Master's Hidden Plan. Okay? You know, Nathan has just finished going through in our men's Bible study all through the book of John. Verse by verse, he's getting up. I don't know what time he gets up, 4, 4.30, whatever it is, prepare to get to church. And, you know, let's give him a round for just his faithfulness and doing that. You know, week after week, you know, that's an awesome thing. And one thing that kind of stood out at me as we went through that is we saw how many times that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophetic words. And we were all kind of amazed, you know, say, yeah, he did this here, you know, and it says this happened. Just like last week we were talking about, you know, that he'd come riding in on a colt of a donkey, you know, and that was actually taken out of Zechariah uh, chapter 9. But here's the thing. The reason I say it was a hidden, the master's hidden plan is because all of that was hidden. In other words, the disciples didn't have a clue. You know, Jesus is telling them, hey, I'm, I'm about to go to the cross. I'm going to be killed. And, turn, and Peter goes, no, that's never going to happen to you. You know, and he said, get behind me, Satan. None of the Pharisees, none of the rulers, 
had a clue about these things. And sometimes I think we think, well, if I'd been there in the Old Testament, you would have known. We would not, you would not have known, and I would not have known. Because you would be taking those verses out of context. And they're hidden. Like in the different Psalms, they're, they're hidden in there. Okay? So brings the question, shouldn't bring the question to your mind. Why are they hidden? Why did he hide it? You know, Satan knows scripture. He knows it better than some of probably we do. Not only does he know it, he quoted it to Jesus. Remember, he's in the wilderness, time of temptation, and he quotes the Spirit. He quotes the Spirit, the Scripture to him. So, here's my premise. It had to be hidden because otherwise he would have never crucified the Lord. And what he thought was his greatest victory turned out to be his greatest defeat. So I want to look at those scriptures. So we're going to go through. First, we're going to look at some. I want to establish who the ruler of the world is first. Then I want to go and look at a bunch of those scriptures that he fulfilled so we can see we wouldn't have a clue either. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So you need to be good Bereans. Check these scriptures out. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 7 and 8. This is, uh, of course, Paul speaking to the uh, Corinthian church. And he says, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom. So there you go, secret wisdom. A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Okay, this was hidden. It wasn't an emergency plan like plan B. This was planned before time began. And then verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, a lot of times we look at that verse and we think of the rulers of this age and we think, well, Pilate, Herod, the Sanhedrin, Jewish priest, and in in a surface level, that's true. But the deeper meaning is who is the ruler of this age. So we're going to look at several scriptures here to verify that. So let's go back to Gospel of John. John chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 28 through 31. Let me find verse 28, 27, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Now the crowd that was there had heard it, and it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. And then Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of the world or a lot of versions will say the ruler of the world, now the prince of this world will be driven out. So who's the ruler? Who's the prince of this world? Talking about Satan. So let's go to John chapter 14. And verse 30. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming, and he has no hold on me. So Jesus was saying the prince of this world, again meaning Satan, is coming. 
but he had no hold. He had no hook on him. There was no darkness within, G, within Jesus. There was no hook for Satan to get. And so it says, he has no hold on me, but it's the prince of the world or the ruler of the world. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Give you another example. Four by four. And verse four says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the God of this world has blinded unbelievers. Okay? Again, it's Satan, his demonic host, has blinded the minds, but he is the God of this age. Ephesians chapter 2, so we just kind of work our way back. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And I'll go, ahead, I'll go ahead and read verse 1, just to keep in contact. It says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who now works at those in those who are disobedient. Again, the ruler of the kingdom of the age. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is a familiar verse that most of you would know. And it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against Herod. It's not against Pilate. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, the spiritual rulers of this age. And now let's go towards the back. Let's go back towards Revelation, 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5 and verse 19. It says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. The whole world is under control of of the evil one. Now, since we're in First John, one of my favorite verses is First John three eight B. I'll go ahead and read the whole the whole verse, but it says, "He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning." Now, here's the B part. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So we can think of a lot of things that Jesus did. He gave, he gave us forgiveness of sin. He, gave us, he had us reconciled to the Father. He made us new creations in Christ Jesus. He gives us eternal life. He does a lot of things. But if you want to boil it down, it's kind of like our little sign out there, knowing God and making him known. Condensing it, it was to undo the works of the evil one. To take back and bring in the kingdom of God, replacing the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. So it shows through those verses that the ruler that he's talking about is actually Satan. And again, Satan knows the word of God. So it had to be hidden. It, it couldn't be opened. 
which also ought to give us a little hint, maybe as we think about the second coming, maybe not have hold too tight to what how we think it's going to turn out, you know, because I think a lot of things are going to be like this. It's going to be, oh, that's what that meant, you know. And I'll go, I told you so. You know? <clears throat> okay, so let's go to, back to Isaiah. We're going to look at some examples. Isaiah chapter 55 first. Verse 8 and 9, again, this is, is familiar, but just to plan it in your head, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Okay, so if we were thinking, okay, what would be the most, uh, the first scripture that you would think about if you were someone you wanted to prove and you wanted to show them how he fulfilled this scripture in the Old Testament, probably one of the first ones you would say would be Isaiah chapter 53, all right? So, Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to read 1 through 9, just so we get context into it. Okay, Isaiah chapter 53 says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. Now he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should des desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed from our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us had turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He has oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, who is like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before a shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, he was smitten. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. So we read through that and we can see how Jesus fulfilled several things in that. But when Isaiah is writing that, he's going, what the heck is that all about? You know? Uh, because it's hidden. If you put it in context of, to the rest of it, it just doesn't make sense. And to show you how that works out in the New Testament, I want us to go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And it's a familiar story of, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So Acts chapter 8 starting in verse 4. And it says, Those who have been scattered, talking about the apostles, preached the word wherever they went. Now Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And when the crowds heard it, I'm going to skip that because we're going to have to read all the way through that, so I'm going to go skip up 
to verse 26. So we can get to the last part of this. Okay, chapter 8, verse 26. So after he ministers in Samaria, we come to verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road and go, that goes down to Jerusalem, to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone up to Jerusalem to worship and was on his way home. He was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, go to the chariot and stay by it. So... This is an important guy. He's a eunuch. He's over all his treasury. Obviously, he's a, a convert to Judaism. He believes in Yahweh. And don't picture in your head like, you know, Ben-Hur in the little chariot. I mean, this is like a big thing. It's more like a big wagon. He's got a driver. He's not, he's not reading and driving, okay, or texting and driving. He, you know, he, he's just sitting. He's got his servants doing all that stuff. He's probably got a couple soldiers with him. And so he's reading. And he just happens to be reading. What a coincidence. Isaiah 53. Just, just a coincidence, I'm sure. And so Philip runs up to the chariot. And it's, then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. And he said, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So the eunuch was reading this passage. Again, he just happens to be reading this particular passage at this time. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth, and in his humiliation, Humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from him from the earth. So the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? So anyone reading this would be asking that question. What the heck? What, what's this about? And again, he just happens to be reading this passage. Phil all of a sudden comes up. Okay. And then Philip began with the very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why should not I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but on his way rejoicing. That's a pretty cool way to travel. Get translated somewhere. But what I want you to see is that you can only see these things through hindsight. Hindsight is 2020. At the time, we wouldn't have had a clue. And so, again, going back to it, there was a reason it had to be hidden. All right, I want to look at a couple different ones in Psalms. So we're going to start in Psalm 69 to give you some examples. Psalm 69, verse 7 through 9. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. Now I am a stranger to my brothers, and an alien to my mother's son. Remember, Jesus' half-brothers didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. 
Verse 9, for zeal for your house consumes me, and the insult of those who insult you fall on me. Now that was fulfilled in Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 17. But again, if you're reading through this psalm, it's a psalm of David. It has nothing about the Messiah. It's just, it's just kind of stuck. It's kind of hidden in there. Also, verse uh, 21 is set by itself. And it just says, They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Remember when he's on the cross and they gave him vinegar? That was John 19, verse 29. But again, that's a single verse stuck in there, out of context, in a long passage. Psalm 22, another prophetic psalm. Psalm 22, there's one in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember when that was filled on the cross? John chapter 19 again. Okay, drop down to verse 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Again, that was in John chapter 19 where the, they were mocking him and saying, you know, if this is your God, come down off that cross. And then down to verse 18. It says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Again, it's fulfilled again, John chapter 19. But again, it's hidden in this psalm. You read through that psalm and don't know what you know now and try to come up with that. Psalms 34, verse 20. It says, he protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Remember, that was fulfilled in John 19, 36. When he came to the cross and they were breaking the bones of the two thieves, but they came to Jesus and saw he was already dead, so they did not break his bones. So we have these different scriptures, these different prophetic scriptures, but they were hidden. They were purposely hidden for that reason. Because again, Satan knows the word of God. It's not hidden. And now my point is that if you were an Old Testament believer and all you had was the Old Testament, you wouldn't have had a clue until those things happened and then you could point back and go, ah, that's what's happening at. And again, what Satan thought was his greatest victory turned out to be his greatest defeat. And so today we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate that our Lord is risen from the dead and that we have eternal life. And we thank God that he's a lot smarter than we are and that he had a plan. And, and it's interesting to go back to before the beginning of time, this was planned. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a plan B. It was his purpose from the beginning of time. It wasn't that like that Adam and Eve sinned and then, oh, no, what am I going to do? He knows the end from the beginning. And so, again, today we have this, this privilege of standing here and, and just worshiping and just thanking the Lord for what he has done. And that's why sometimes it seems like, as we look at the disciples, we think, it seemed like they were clueless a lot. Well, they were, but we would have been too. I mean, we, were, we would have been in the same boat. We would have been in the same boat. So, Jesse, why don't you go ahead and come up. We're going to have some worship. Not that Jesse, the good-looking Jesse, not the other one here.
<clears throat> no. Nothing personal, just, just saying. So, uh, again, today is the day when we have life abundant, we have life eternally that we get to spend with our Lord in heaven. What a day to celebrate. He is not dead. He is not in the tomb. He is alive. He is alive. And because he's alive, we're alive. And we will be alive. And as we get our new bodies, our upgrade, it's going to be glorious, awesome. It's going to be an awesome time. So let's just kind of get in that, that mood of just thankfulness for what has been done on our behalf. And I want to open it up a time for anybody who would like to come for, for prayer. If you don't know the Lord, as you have that personal relationship with him, feel free to come up. We'll be glad to pray, with, lead you in that prayer. If you need healing, whatever you may need, something going on in a relationship, or maybe it's just emotional things going on, and Whatever it is, feel free to come into the presence of the Lord. Because as we enter in, the Lord meets us. We open our hearts, he will meet us. So those of you who can stand, let's go ahead and stand. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you that we celebrate Resurrection Sunday today. That today we have been set free. Lord, do you have redeemed us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light and so Lord we celebrate we, we say thank you Lord thank you for your hidden plan thank you Lord that you had a plan from the beginning of a time that would redeem us that would restore us in relationship to you that would give us life an abundant life Lord you've given us so much and your ways are so much higher than our ways. And your thoughts so much higher than our thoughts, Lord. We just say thank you, Lord. Lord, we want to bask in your presence, Lord. Because it's your presence, Lord, that we covet, that we long for, that we cry out for the more, Lord. Lord, we know we're going to spend eternity with you, but Lord, in this life, in this day, in this time, we want to experience you more and more. So, Lord, we're asking, Lord, that even this morning, you would come and meet this people as we present ourselves before you, that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that you would stir our hearts, Lord, that you would do a work that only you can do. That you would change hearts and minds. And Lord, anyone who is in that place of fear, Lord, you've come to deliver us from fear. Because Lord, we have security in you. And Lord, you, we know that you know the end from the beginning. And so Lord, we rest in you. And we say, Lord, come, come this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, do a deep work within us. Touch our hearts anew and afresh. Renew our minds, Lord, by the washing of your word. But Lord, touch us emotionally. Touch us in our inner man. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Come and do a deep work within us. In Jesus' mighty name.